All right. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Musics and Music Show. Thank you for being faithful viewers and listeners. I am Egben Biban Mojimbo, and I'm coming to you on Vosa World Radio, as is always the case on Saturday mornings and on YouTube on Sunday mornings or afternoons. Again, I have a guest with me this time. And as you know, I am always happier when I have one because it means I'm getting somebody with an expert on something, be it health, be it entertainment, something. And this time, um, I have somebody who's going to be talking about health. In fact, I am praying and hoping that this is not going to be the first and only time that this is the first of many other similar shows where we can cover issues that have to do with health because our health is our wealth. All the other things we do, we can only do them if we are healthy. So that's where we're going to today. But I'm going to ask her to introduce herself first so you know you're not going to be listening to somebody who is just a charlatan as they call it, somebody that was taken off the street to come and just babble. They know what they're talking about. So please, ma'am, go ahead and introduce yourself. Who are we uh, listening to or watching today? Thank you so much, Sister Itunde, for having me. I'm excited to be here with you. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Malingo Elangwe. Mm -hmm. I am a mom. I'm an aunt. Mm -hmm. I am a sister, mm -hmm. a registered nurse, a women's rights advocate, uh -huh. a public health professional, and a founder of a grassroots organization which is focused on improving the health of people in vulnerable communities. But you heard her. You're very welcome to the show. You heard her. She gave you her credentials. So now you know when you listen to her speak, you know you're listening to somebody, an authority in the area. So there's many things that she can cover, but today we have chosen to talk about one thing that is predominant in our society that is a problem, and that is diabetes, okay? So I'm going to start from the basics because I'm here and I don't know the first thing about anything. So I'm going to start by asking you, what is diabetes? And how many types are there? Because I've had type one, type, type two, type something. So, what is it? Can you just tell us a little bit of what it is and how many types are there to start with? Thank you for that question. I'll do my best to explain it. It's a broad question. <laughs> okay, diabetes is a metabolic, it's a group of metabolic uh, conditions that affect various organs of the body mm -hmm. and it causes hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia just means elevated blood sugars. Okay. And people who suffer from diabetes would present with various signs and symptoms mm -hmm. prior to the diagnosis. Okay. So there are, before they used to say there are two types of diabetes, but right now we have our four types of diabetes. Wow. So typically so then, were those, were those ones always there and we did not know them or they, uh, or they are new? They were always there, but the focus were not was not on them. Okay, okay. The focus has always been on type 1 and type 2. But guess what? We have gestational diabetes. We have something which is non-specific diabetes. It's called uh, latent autoimmune uh, diabetes of adult onset. Wow. So these people behave sometimes like type 1 diabetics. Another time they behave like type 2 diabetes. It's a very complex condition when it comes to treatment. So the, the question is, what is type 1 diabetes? Type 1 diabetes is usually characterized by complete insulin deficiency. It's diagnosed, most of the time it's diagnosed during childhood years or teen years, mm -hmm. where the child presents to the hospital being very sick with elevated blood sugars, then when they do testing and blood work, they find out that, hey, this child has diabetes. The pancreas of people with type 1 diabetes is not working. They don't produce no kind of insulin. So everything they eat, which is related to carbohydrates, has a potential to elevate their blood sugars. So guess what? They are dependent on insulin. Then now type 2 diabetes is adult onset diabetes. 
most people are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after the age of about 40 or 45. And it is related to insulin insufficiency or insulin resistance, meaning the pancreas are producing insulin, but maybe they're not producing it enough. Okay. Some of the cells in the pancreas that are supposed to be producing insulin are dead. They're not working the way they're supposed to work. So that results in insulin insufficiency. Other times, mm -hmm. the insulin is produced, but the body becomes resistant to it. So the insulin is there, but it's not working. Uh -huh. And what so, is- the, my, my quick question is what would cause that if it was working before, what would cause that? That's well, a good me, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Let me just- That is going. good, I love that. <laughs> let, let, let me listen to you. So you just define them all, oh, then I'm going, okay, well, so, sorry, my bad. Just no, me, just tell no, us. interject anytime. Because I'm hearing you say it just stopped working. Like, what did I do to get it to stop working? What, what, yes. What's going on there? It's, that yeah. was my so question. It happens. The body becomes resistant to insulin. And what happens at that time is a lot of times it has to do with adiposity, fat. So obesity is the major issue here. Yes. Insulin is being produced, but because of adiposity, high amounts of fat in the body, the insulin is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So that results in insulin resistance. Got it. Got it. Please go right ahead. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine, Sister Itonde. Then gestational diabetes. This is also characterized by insulin resistance during pregnancy. So now you are pregnant then the body produces, the pancreas produces insulin, but guess what? Because of hormonal changes and all kinds of things going on, your body is not using the insulin the way it's supposed to be used. So now blood sugars get elevated. And this happens usually between the second and the third trimester of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So that's why if you're pregnant, you go to the hospital during second or third trimester, they will give you concentrated glucose or to drink and then they draw blood after a few hours. Then now the latent uh, autoimmune diabetes of adult onset, this, is, this happens in a funny way because most of these people were diagnosed with type two diabetes at the beginning. Mm -hmm. They were on oral medications. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden the oral medications stop working. They, they, sometimes they might start them on insulin. Then they just realize that they need more and more and more and more insulin or sometimes two or three other medications to control their sugar. So now the doctor might say, oh, let me check for antibodies to see if you have antibodies that are against your insulin production. And when they do that, they find out that they're positive for antibodies. And now they become, they call them ladder. Okay. So that's a non-specific diabetes. Okay, so you can you just suddenly have that one when you did not have the, the, the type 2 before, you just up and now directly you're on this stage, kind of the same way cancer can come and you, you, by the time they find you, you already have stage 4 cancer, or is it that that must be a prior thing, you must have had another type of diabetes before you get to this stage, is that how it works? It can develop both ways. Okay. So you may be diabetic at the very beginning with type two, then all of a sudden you develop ladder, or you may just show up and with hyperglycemia at a certain point and they find out that you are positive for antibodies. Okay, okay. So it's something that is not well understood at this time. I'm still doing the research and stuff. Yes. Okay, so let me just ask a, a blunt question. How serious is diabetes, all of these types? Um, and I, my, the way I'm, I'm coming from there is I had the gestational kind, for example. So when I'm done having the baby, is it gone or mm -hmm. that, so how alarming is this whole diabetes thing? Um, how serious is it? Diabetes is a serious condition. Mm -hmm. Um, some scientists are saying that it is, uh, a, an epidemic right now, mm -hmm. uh, globally, there is an organization called the International Diabetes Federation. It's like an umbrella organization that works to empower people who live with diabetes and educate providers about diabetes care. So they monitor, they, they follow, they, they do research and then they collect data on what is happening when it comes to diabetes. Mm -hmm. So based on their data, they are saying that as of 2021, we have about 537 million people who are living with diabetes. 
So diagnosed. Diagnosed, they... yes, living with diabetes. This does not include. Then they they even projected that this number is gonna, going to rise by the year 2030. That by the year 2030, we are looking at at least 643 million people. The rate at, at which we are going. The rate at which we are going. And by 2045, about 782 million people would be living with diabetes. Hmm. What even makes this worse is the fact that um, three out of four people living with diabetes reside in low to middle income countries. Hmm. Think about Africa. Right. right. And our beloved Cameroon and that mix. Yeah. Right. So I think what we should be doing then now is trying to figure out um, how to stem this uh in whatever way possible so let me start by asking what are the risk factors let's let's start there what are the risk factors um yeah or, okay let, i already asked to let me let me even backtrack a little bit i already asked whether it is reversible i should, I should ask whether that's it like the person who's pregnant if you if you, have, if you have the baby are you then free of it and then if you're diagnosed at what type one type two can you then take the medication and follow some treatment and you're healed? Okay. <laughs> yeah, those all those questions are related to each other. I'll do my best. And if I miss any part of it, just refrain. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, about 90%, type 2 diabetes accounts for about 90% of all diabetes cases in the world. Okay. So a lot of people who are diagnosed, you hear about they have type 2, type 2. So... Uh, Basically, diabetes is not reversible. Hmm. There's a lot of confusion when it comes to what we see on TV and uh, information that people put on the internet and supplements that people sell talking about diabetes being reversible. Mm -hmm. If you look at the details of the pathophysiology of diabetes, how the disease, the disease progression, that really explains the answer that diabetes is not reversible. Okay, type one, as we said before, is an autoimmune condition that the body uh, attacks itself and kills the pancreatic cells that are responsible to produce insulin. Mm -hmm. When those cells are killed, they are gone. They oh, cannot regenerate. They regenerate, yes. So if the cells do not regenerate after they are dead, how can we say that diabetes is reversible? Mm -hmm. Then, when it comes to about managing living with it, that's that's the key thing. You're talking about living with it, meaning you have it has come to stay, and you're yes. managing the condition. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can go into remission when it comes to type two diabetes. You can go into remission because okay. type two diabetes is a progressive loss of the beta cells of the pancreas. So it's over time. By the time most people are diagnosed with type two diabetes they have lost about 40 to 50% of their pancreatic function. Hmm. So even with type two diabetes, you can't reverse it. However, you can control it and manage it to the point where you can be stable and achieve your target blood sugars. Okay. When you're newly diagnosed, you can go into remission, meaning that you can stay for a few months doing lifestyle without taking any medications. But that is what most endocrinologists will call honeymoon phase. It lasts just for a short period of time. <laughs> and then the pancreas says, oh, I'm tired. Right. Hmm. So it's not reversible, but it's manageable. There's a big difference then. It's good to make, make that very clear. So yeah. don't, don't, you don't go around saying, I'm healed of this thing. Mm -hmm. It's a condition you're going to have manage. You can have remission, but it tends to come to come back. So you have a lifestyle where you're going to manage, which means you're going to have to be on medication. You're Not all the time, though. Lifestyle lifestyle is the, the key thing. Is the key thing when it comes to diabetes management. It, it okay. really accounts for about 80% of your success managing the disease. I see. No, medication is only about 20%. I see. So you asked the question about the risk factors. So what are the risk factors? Of course, we know with uh, type 1, there's genetic predisposition. So the risk factor, are you going to say it's bloodline, genetics? <laughs> runs in the family kind of thing. Yes. But for type 2, there are many risk factors. And we have uh, modifiable risk factors and unmodifiable risk factors. So the modifiable, the unmodifiable, of course, is genetics. 
because science says that if you have a first degree relative who has type 2 diabetes, you stand a 40% chance of developing it. And by first degree, let's define that we mean immediate, like father, yes. mother, siblings? Correct. Okay. Father, mother, sister, brother, first degree relative. If you have any of those who have who has uh, type 2 diabetes, you stand a 40% chance of developing the disease. Hmm. So that's the genetic uh, aspect of risk when it comes to risk factors. Then the modifiable uh, risk factors pertain to lifestyle. Yes. Okay. Diet. What are you eating? Physical activity. Are you sedentary? Are you obese? Stress. And, and by, by sedentary, let's so all these things, because you're talking about the medical terms and some people who are listening to us may not know sedentary meaning. It's not, a, you're not really mobile. Yes, you're not moving. moving. You're not exercising. Yes. Yes, you know, which which is a major thing for us out here, much less than it is in Cameroon, but out here are things you sit, you can sit all day. That's why some of us actually have the watches that tell us, it has to buzz and say, get up and walk. You yes. need that kind of reminder, not for me, actually, because when you're teaching, you are walking around yes. the classroom and stuff. But look, you get in the thing, there's an elevator taking you, an escalator carrying you to places, your car that you're driving to places in. You even have the drive through things so you can sit and sit and sit and not move then so, a lot of jobs if you are doing administration you're moving from meeting right. to meeting to meeting you're sitting so some people are requesting for the high table now in their offices so they can stand right. while they're meeting. right mm -hmm. right right so lifestyle is a big issue when it comes to uh, risk factors for diabetes then there are other things that people don't talk about remember we just talked about uh uh, gestational diabetes right if you Pregnancy. had gestational diabetes when you're having during your childbearing years mm -hmm. you also stand it's a you also have a significant risk of developing diabetes maybe 10 years later wow so they we have seen that pattern people with gestational diabetes they stop having their babies then they show up to clinic last baby is maybe 18 19 20 years old they show up to clinic and they're type 2 so it was just dormant there and waiting? The, the, it has to probably do with something happened to the pancreas when they had gestational diabetes. See. It increased I their see. risk. I see. Then you also have the use of medications, which we don't pay attention to. We have a lot of kids who are asthmatics. They put them on steroids to decrease airway inflammation so they can breathe. Guess what steroids do? They cause diabetes. But again, you have to do what they call the you, you weigh the risk against the benefits. That's why most physicians will put it for, put a child on steroids, maybe short-term use, or put an adult with arthritis on steroids for short-term use, because that's the issue with steroids. So you're trying to fix HIV and it, and it, Yeah, you're trying to fix one condition and it is making another one. Uh, bringing another uh, uh, risk, another problem, just by the fact that you're trying to fix one issue and then it's causing another one. And then so you're forced to weigh which one am I better off with? Let me fix my asthma and then just deal with the consequences, the risk. Wow. It's almost mm -hmm. like they're bound to get you somewhere, one way or the other. <laughs> one way or the other. Oh, Lord. Un unintentionally. You minimize <laughs> the risk by, by shortening the duration of the therapy. So okay. they put whoever is a patient on the use on the steroids just for a short period of time. That's the okay. only way you can minimize the risk. All right. But my, my natural question, Lehman's question is, I needed the thing. That's why you put me on it. So yes, short term indeed. use. So when I stop the, using it, then uh, am I healed of my asthma? Um, hopefully at that point, the inflammation that was causing airway obstruction mm -hmm. has been taken care of. And you have gone over the uh, asthma, the the flare of the disease, or the we call it exacerbation. The flare is gone. You can breathe better, so you don't need it at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're, you've already been touched on what I was going to ask next, kind of because you've mentioned obesity. I mean, that's the thing. You said lifestyle, what you eat. But I'm going to say, what, what, how can we prevent or manage it? Because it's two different things. Prevent, so you don't even have it in the first place, 
And then if you do have it, unfortunately, and it's not even reversible, how do you manage it? That's, that's a good question. Okay. So if you already have diabetes, mm -hmm. now you're looking at management to achieve and maintain, and maintain normal blood sugar levels. Right. Or target blood sugar levels. I shouldn't say normal. Then if you do not have diabetes and you have risk factors, you're mm -hmm. obese, um, you do not exercise, um, you have a high stress level job and all of those risk factors, then you want to do... Uh, interventions to prevent it. So there is there we have um, a system that is called the seven self-care behaviors for diabetes. Mm -hmm. It was developed by uh, American Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Mm -hmm. So those seven behaviors are basically built around lifestyle. So the first one is what? Eating healthy, we talked about it. I have heard many people talk about, oh, I'm going to go on a non-carbohydrate diet and it's not sustainable because we get energy from two major food nutrients. The two major food nutrients are what? Carbohydrates and fat. Right. That's where most of our energy comes from. Mm -hmm. So you can cut back on carbs. You can eliminate simple sugars, all the cakes and donuts and things that we like. You can eliminate those, but you eat complex carbohydrates. That's the vegetables, the fruits, the uh, sweet potatoes instead of white potatoes and all of that. So you can have a healthy diet based on portion control and on making good choices. Right. Instead of abandoning something altogether, you eat so you less, a little, a little, much less of it. Moderation. Controls, yes. Yeah, moderation is the key. And you can do that through meal planning. The issue with us is our lives are so busy that when it's time to eat, we grab and eat. Whatever we can find. And Whatever we can find. Driving home. I said, driving home. And like, mm -hmm. when am I going to get home? I start to put a pot on the fire. So you're like, okay, just drive by here and you go pointing at the burger there, number five, number six, fries and this. You're just eating it and just, just driving. I'm sitting here, I'm sorry for my own self, <laughs> right there, just <laughs> listening to this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, so because yeah. of lifestyle commitments in our lives, that really affects our ability to plan meals ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And that imp impedes our health. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the second issue that we mentioned before, it's what? Um, physical activity. You have to move. American uh, Heart Association recommends that we stay active for a minimum of 150 minutes a week. So that translates to about 30 minutes of physical activity daily. Daily. I call it physical activity and not exercise because the whole idea is for you to move. Mm -hmm. Exercise is a structured thing that you say, I'm going to do uh, 10 uh, jumping jacks, I'm going to do that. Get on a treadmill, yeah. go jogging, that kind of a thing. But some people hear that are like, hey, I can't do that, but at least you can walk. Yeah, physical activity is not structured, but you are moving, mm -hmm. you know. So that's the second thing. Then the third thing is managing stress. There is a relationship between stress and dietary habits. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about it, especially for women. You talk about binge eating. Emotional eating. Correct. The moment you feel down, guess what? You need a chocolate. Right. <laughs> Comfort. Then the, then, the mo then the moment you feel sad, console yourself with yes. chocolate. Some ice cream. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's just, yeah. You know, so you, you have to know lifestyle modification addresses all those issues. You have to know what are your triggers. Right. And then you have to have a plan to prevent those triggers. Mm -hmm. So if you know that traffic is your trigger and by the time you get to work, you'll be gulping down four cups of coffee with lots of cream and sugar, then what do you do? You leave, house, you leave your house Maybe on time. I can pat myself on the back for that <laughs> one. I discovered the thing that that is the one thing. And I don't even have a long commute. But that's the one thing that just rattles me in, in a way that I cannot even explain what it is about this whole driving thing. So it just, just this year, I said, just get up earlier, 
get all the things, whatever it is you're trying to even listen to on that radio, you're trying to go, get to the work first and do it there, as opposed to sitting here and leaving late. If it's something you can do at work by getting there earlier, then go, get there, take a deep breath, and then you can yeah. go ahead and do that. Because there used to be some meditation thing I used to like to listen to. Yeah. And I was like, no, I need to wait and hear it first. Then I go. No, exactly. go sit down there and exactly. then actually concentrate. I, I do a similar thing to alleviate stress. I get to work about 30 minutes early. I have a to-do list. I usually develop my to-do list the day before I leave work. So when I come in that morning, 30 minutes before I start my meetings, I go over the to-do list and I put them in order of priority. So that really helps to make your work day flow. It does. It does. I can I say amen to what you're saying there. Mm -hmm. I can even put the stuff I need for the next day already on the board there. The date has changed. Everything is there. Exactly. Do some things the night before, like even what you're going to wear to work. Mm -hmm. Put it out already right down to my earrings and the things. So when I get it up in the morning, it's not rushing, rushing. What am I going to do? Hair doesn't look good, which is why I've cut my own off together. <laughs> and do some things which, which can help reduce some of the stress. Yes. So the question many people will ask is, uh, how does stress really affect your blood sugar? Because if the way the body is built, we have the fight flight response. So when you're stressed, the body releases uh, a chemical known as cortisol. What is cortisol? It's a steroid. It's a natural steroid. The same steroid thing we just talked about again. Here yeah. So what? guess that will also do what? It would also cause facilitate the release of glucose from the body. Mm -hmm. And then you end up with high glucose levels. So that's what stress can do. It do a similar, you have a similar reaction with blood pressure when, you're, when you oh, are stressed, it? Right. it causes vasoconstriction. Blood, all your blood vessels get tight. When that happens, your blood pressure goes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So stress is a big factor. Then the other issue when it comes to lifestyle, the other uh, factor that we want to consider is uh, the use of alcohol and tobacco. That is also related to stress and there are triggers. I have, I have interviewed quite a few people who smoke and drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. A lot of them will turn around and tell you at the end of the day that it's a coping mechanism. Or after a, a hard day at work, I just have to have a bottle of water. That's how I pay myself. It's even a lifestyle back home for many people. On your way back home, you just run off, off, off license, yes, and drink, drown your sorrows and worries. Yeah. And cause a new problem in the process. It's a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm so happy because there are physicians now who are doing what they call integrative health, where they introduce other methods of, of uh, other methods of staying healthy, like meditation and all of that. Right. So those could be methods which you can use to alleviate stress. As opposed to taking another thing from a bottle again, another actual medication, which as you have said before, has its own side effects. It as does. Something you're just doing naturally. Oh, wow. Then just to add some flesh on that, mm -hmm. when it comes to alcohol, alcohol is not a good thing with diabetes. Alcohol and diabetes don't go hand to hand. Alcohol can cause a significant drop in your blood sugar. Hmm. Meaning after you drink alcohol, I don't know if you've heard about people who were alcoholics, they went, they drank, they went to sleep and never woke up. Hmm. I know a few. Right, I know a few. So too. alcohol can cause what they call alcohol-induced hypoglycemia, meaning alcohol-induced low blood sugar. Right. And then you become unresponsive in your sleep and nobody knows and that's it. Yeah. You wake up in the morning and that's the thing. And this, we thought to, okay, the, the person just came and was just drunk and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. they realized what he did, the damage. I know quite a few. Yeah. That, that was the story. So he was out drinking, came back, went yeah. to bed, didn't wake up. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, the, and the risk factor related to alcohol and hypoglycemia is what? Drinking alcohol on an empty stomach, which most alcoholics do. Mm -hmm. They so eaten. we tell people who have diabetes, if you have diabetes and you have to drink for any reason, make at sure least, that you have eaten. At least eat something. Eat something before you drink. Mm -hmm. 
Then the other thing is you have to stay away from mixed drinks, the margaritas and tequilas. They make them with high fructose syrup. I see. Fructose is what? Fruit sugar, concentrated fruit sugar. Right. So after you drink them, then you have a rapid spike in your blood sugar. So alcohol can drive your blood sugar one, one direction or the other direction. You mm. can end up with very low blood sugars oh. or you can have elevated sugars, depending on what you drank, how you drank it, when you had it, mm -hmm. you know. Wow, there's a lot of things to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so, um, but I've heard, okay, you talked about managing, managing the condition. I've heard about the word control, well, controlled diabetes. So you have it, it's not going anywhere because you said it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. So how do you stay on track with it? How do you manage it and keep it under control, if I can call it that way? What are the things you should do? You it talked about the lifestyle changes already, but, but, but so can you get to a point where if you do that, you follow those directives you've given, manage the stress, uh, eat right, uh, ex not necessarily exercise, but keep active, then are you like kind of, can you now coast along or how? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can control it doing what is recommended, what your provider or your physician or nurse practitioner tells you to do. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, a mnemonic, we, we, we say the ABCs of diabetes, of diabetes. Mm -hmm. A stands for A1C. Okay. A1C a like capital A, then figure one C. Okay, A one C is a blood test that is usually done to evaluate your blood sugar for the past two to three months. Okay. The goal for someone who's, who lives with diabetes is to maintain their A one C below 7%. Okay, so is this something you're going to monitor your own self at home? Or you're going to have to go the somewhere. doctor, once you have diabetes, the doctor will probably check your A1C. If you're poorly controlled, the doctor will check your A1C every three months. But if oh. you're well controlled, he can check it tw twice a year. Oh, okay. So, and based on that, the doctor would tell you what is your target goal for your A1C. The ADA, which is American Diabetes Association, says A1C should be less than 7%. But at the same time, they say it should be individualized okay. based on age and comorbidities, meaning other illnesses which the person may have. Say, if I have diabetes and I go to see my doctor, the doctor will say, oh, you're young, you're in so, 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 so age, you're middle age, uh, we should keep your A1C below 7%. Mm -hmm. But if an 80-year-old man comes in who has kidney disease, has heart disease, has mm -hmm. all kinds of other things, I tried it, the doctor may say, with you, your A1C at 8.5% is good. Because older people stand the chance of having very low sugars because they don't eat as much as they used to eat. They have lost some of their taste buds. Right. You know. So they have, they are at high risk of having low sugar. Mm -hmm. Then they also have a, a renal insufficiency. Some of the medications that they take, the body does not excrete them as quickly as when you're young. Mm -hmm. So if they're taking those medications and those medications are stacking in the body, are, are slowly being excreted and they're not eating enough and you are trying to put them at a very low target for blood sugar, guess what? They will be having back-to-back -back low blood sugars. And low blood sugar and older people can cause a heart attack. I was just going to ask, like, what are the, what, what actually the things that, what are the, so, the things that can manage? Yeah. So that is letter A. B wow. is blood pressure control. Okay. The goal is for your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 80. I know there are new studies that, are, that which states 120 over 80, but we, we're still That's going. With, yeah, we're still going with 130 over 80 for right now. Okay. Then um, you have C, which is your cholesterol panel. Well, I have Let's, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So I'm going to talk about it. Okay. So there is a, a relationship between high cholesterol and high blood sugar. It's just like they are bodies. As your blood sugar is going up, cholesterol is going up. You see most people who are 
have type 2 diabetes are also on cholesterol medications. They go so the cholesterol panel has like four different types of fat to simplify it. It has a total cholesterol. Total cholesterol should be less than 200 milligrams per deciliter to be under control. Mm -hmm. Then you have the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. LDL should be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Mm -hmm. Then you have the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, high density lip lipoprotein. For HDL for females, it should be higher than 50. And I'm gonna explain why. Mm -hmm. And HDL for males should be higher than 40. Mm -hmm. After our childbearing years, when all those beautiful hormones are gone, mm -hmm. guess what? Our risk for heart disease increases more than males. Okay, which 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 begs the question. So if you don't have any children, are you just then not not going to be in that part, in that bracket of risk? Even if you do not have any children, you're gonna go through your body. Correct, correct. And your body still did the cycle and still did all the other things. Exactly. You had to... <laughs> Right. So it increases the risk of, for heart disease. That's why they decided that HDL, which protects the heart and all of that stuff, should be greater than 50 for females and greater than 40 for males. Then you have the triglycerides. Excess fats are stored as triglycerides. Mm -hmm. Triglycerides should be what? Less than 150. So those are the four components of the lipid panel that the doctor is going to talk to you about. All of this comes in your diabetes management. Okay. And how then, much of this can you do on your own at home? And how much of it do you have to go to the a medical facility for them to have it checked? For example, is there a machine that will check any of these things at home? You have to see your doctor on a regular basis. Most diabetics will see their doctors either quarterly, every three months or every six months. Most people with diabetes. So this is... The doctor will tell you about lifestyle, eat healthy, exercise, monitor your blood sugar. Those are the seven self-care behaviors of diabetes. That you mentioned already. So the seven self-care behaviors include monitoring your blood sugar at home. When you monitor your blood sugar at home, there are target goals. That's the finger sticks that you do. Your fasting blood sugar, to know if your sugar is under control, your fasting blood sugar should be between 80 to, 80 to 130 in the morning. Correct. Just please explain what fasting blood sugar means because somebody's listening and not understanding what it means. Okay. So fasting blood sugar is the, the blood sugar that you check before you eat your first meal, which is breakfast. Correct. Mm -hmm. Before you even drink water. Because water is a solvent. It's going to dilute the concentration of your sugar. So first thing in the morning, your fasting blood sugar is what you check before you eat anything. And mm -hmm. the goal for your fasting blood sugar when you have diabetes is that it should be between 80 to 130. Mm -hmm. Then if you have eaten two hours after a meal, say you had lunch and you just feel, I feel sluggish and I have diabetes. Let me just check and see what's going on. So you, you never check your blood sugar immediately after you eat because you're going to have a faulty high. Okay. So you check it two hours after the meal. Mm -hmm. So two hours after the meal, the clock starts ticking from the first bite, not two hours after the plate is empty. Two different things. It is. Say that, say that again. The clock starts ticking from when? From, from the, the first, first bite. bite. So if you take you eat if that little thing, you leave the food there, run and go to do something else, it does. It, it's, it's that first bite that still counts, not the fact that it took The first bite counts. So two hours after the meal, if my first bite was at 8 a.m. My two hours after the meal is 10 a.m. It's not two hours after my plate is empty. Right. So two hours after the meal, the goal should be less than 180. Mm -hmm. That's your goal. Your blood sugar should be less than 180. Mm -hmm. Then at bedtime, the goal is that your blood sugar should be between 100 and 140. So if you're checking your sugars at home, excuse me, <clears throat> mm -hmm. sorry that's okay mm -hmm. if you're checking your sugars at home those are the goals that you keep at the back of your head right 
And if you're if you're the person <laughs> monitoring me. somebody else, that's what you two should know when you look at the thing, you, you do the reading, you should check it against those those numbers. Those are the parameters. And then uh, if if it's not what it should be, what should you do? <coughs> Sorry about that. If if you don't achieve your target, mm -hmm. we do what they call uh, pattern management. Okay. Meaning that you document your sugars every time that you check. Mm -hmm. So when you bring it to the hospital, I could look at it and say, hmm, 7 a.m. on Monday, your blood sugar was 60. Mm -hmm. At 12 noon, it was 1, it was 2.30. At bedtime, it was 300. So the day before Sunday night, did you eat? Why do we have a low sugar? Oh, yes, I was so tired. After church, I didn't eat. So the, the, the values can give you a lot of information. Right. So that's what we call pattern management. That's why you need to take check the sugars and bring those records to the hospital because those blood sugar values guide treatment decisions. It's like, like, like data that you have the data and then figure out what exactly, which means no two people necessarily have the same thing. No two people, yes. So that's the first thing when it comes to monitoring. That's why we say one of the first self-care behaviors is blood sugar monitoring. The second self-care behavior is what? Healthy eating. Mm -hmm. You never skip meals. You distribute your carbohydrates throughout the day. You eat breakfast, you eat lunch, you eat dinner. You never say, oh, I didn't eat breakfast, so my lunch will be a big lunch. I'll eat double the amount. Unfortunately, the body does not accept dumping. You just cannot take a whole lot and put it in there. It will result in elevated sugars. Right. So you eat a small breakfast, a small lunch, a small dinner, and you can have snacks between th three snacks. Mm -hmm. You can have maybe a cup of oatmeal and half a banana in the morning. Mm -hmm. You can have a handful of nuts in between breakfast and lunch. Then you have your lunch, maybe a salad or a vegetable wrap. Then you have a cup of yogurt. Then you have your dinner, some vegetable soup or something. So you have to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we talk and about... I'm noticing that you're not calling achu and koki in, the, in that whole thing and ikwang and stuff. And that is what... You can still have your achu, but instead of having a big bowl of the fufu, the fufu mm -hmm. is like uh, mashed potatoes. Right. You do half a cup of that pounded fufu. Mm hmm and that's only about what? About 15 grams of carbohydrates. Then you drink lots of soup and your protein. So you can still eat everything. You right. just have to understand the concept of portion control. Correct. Correct. You know? And I don't know whether, because for the, for the other things, um, they are kind of measured. The, the, the items, the food items that are out here are kind of measured. They will tell you that a banana has this number of calories and so on. So I'll get into that. Okay, please go right ahead. <laughs> So, so talking about diet and portion control, you mm -hmm. can manage portions two ways. The simplest way is something we call the plate method. Okay. If you, if you just Google my healthy plate, you'll see it. The plate method just describes what kinds of food you can put on your plate and how much you can put on your plate. So it says when you have a plate, your plate should be no more than nine inches in diameter mm -hmm. and half of that plate should have non-starchy vegetables when it comes to vegetables we have two groups you have the starchy vegetables and you have the non-starchy starchy vegetables are like what your potatoes corn peas beans those are starchy vegetables mm -hmm. so in an african context it means what our fufu is like starchy vegetable our plantain fufu is like starchy vegetable Okay, I'm for food through it. Yes, yeah. all of those, you know. Then you also have grains. Grains are what? Your rice and couscous and quinoa. Mm -hmm. Those things should only occupy one fourth of your plate. Meaning if you draw a circle right. and you divide it divide into, into four, four halves, one half out of those four portions, that's where your fufu and plantain and potatoes, rice should be no more than that fourth of the plate. Then 
your protein should be three to four ounces, size of your palm. No more than that. Then half of the plate should be your non-starchy vegetables. Correct. These Broccoli, are must cabbage, string beans, Brussels sprouts, ndule, you know, half of the plate. Mm -hmm. Ndule is healthy, by the way, because ndule is what? Peanuts. Peanuts, very high in protein. Mm -hmm. Egusi, very high in protein. All right. And I'm sure, I'm sure I think you're not talking about indole where after I'm done cooking it, then you pour oil. The thing is just <laughs> that is what kills us. <laughs> That's the, thing. the oil is just shining and glittering on the thing. You're like, yes. And that is the issue. Whereas the indole That's is the not right the problem. Mm -hmm. That's the weakness right there. So mm -hmm. that's it about diet. Then you have um, physical activity. We already talked about physical activity that being mm -hmm. active for at least 150 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. All you do, you need is leisure walking. Just walk for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that is done. Then you also have um, taking medications. A lot of people from my minority groups have ad adherence problem. We do not believe in taking medications. Mm -hmm. When I did diabetes research, one of the things my qualitative data showed was the fact that people believed that those medications would cause harm, so they resort to herbs and every other thing that they knew. Bet for the medication itself. Bet for the medication. So we, we rebelled against vaccines too. Like yes. When it came to the COVID, we were the ones that were least likely to, to yes. more likely to say no it, and the conspiracy theories and all. Yeah. And not wishing to take the thing. We have that tendency. So medication adherence is a big problem. The other aspect for medication adherence is the lack of insurance. Definitely. So sometimes people Definitely. don't have the insurance to go to the hospital or even if they are seen by a physician on fee based fee, uh, fee basis that where they pay out of pocket, right. they don't have the money to buy the medicine. Right. It's a funny thing. And this is so it. this is a common issue, a common barrier to care, especially in minority groups and in low to middle income countries. Right. It's, so, it's, a, it's a sad kind of vicious cycle because then, like you talked about healthy eating, okay, you go now to try to get something organic. Have you seen the cost of those organic things you're trying to get? Yes. So the person with that low income, like, as you're saying, tends to do the uh, McDonald's, a dollar, I don't know why it's like this, a dollar, a meal, something, thing. So it's not mm -hmm. healthy, but that's what they can afford. So it's, it's really, and then when they do get sick, then they can't afford the treatment too and it's like um it, it's 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 it, it's, a, it's a terrible cycle but sometimes it just takes education because sometimes i tell uh i tell uh people i work with like mm -hmm. you don't need to have a lot of money to eat healthy all you need to do is get some chicken drumsticks chop some carrots in that pot put some celery in that pot put all kinds of vegetables fix a big pot of soup Right. Eat that soup with half of a sandwich. That's a vegetable soup. No oil, just your protein and different types of vegetables. Eat it with half of a sandwich. Boil a potato and throw it in a bowl with that soup and eat it. That soup can carry you along for three, four days. Fix a pot of beans. That's complex carbohydrates that has some protein. Mm -hmm. Throw some turkey necks in it. Right. And all you need is what? Two scoops of or, or one third cup of brown rice and then lots of the beans and you're eating healthy. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a lot of money, okay. but you need, the, you need the knowledge and you need to right. be willing to do it that way. Right, right. Just forget about the, all that, the, the, your favorite things that you've eaten all your life yes. and yes. say, this is a life and death issue. Let me go ahead and, and, and do what will still work. And it's amazing how sometimes when some of us even have fallen off the wagon after following a certain regime, a certain thing, it's amazing how your body sometimes gets used to the, the new thing that you're doing. Yes. So you start getting now cravings and what we call clean clay langa. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to the thing and fall off the wagon and go back to those things. But sometimes after saying, I cannot touch that thing, I can't eat broccoli, I won't do. And you make yourself eat the broccoli and the carrots, then it doesn't seem so bad after everything. And, and cravings become very strong when you deprive yourself. What we need to learn how to do is to do it in moderation. You can have one or two pieces of, of uh, chocolate, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but you know it's one or two pieces. Mm -hmm. You can have a little bit of chin chin, but you know just a handful and that's it. And the next three months, maybe I won't eat it. Mm -hmm. When you do that, your subconscious makes you believe like you can have everything. So the, the issue about having a very strong craving is not even something to worry about. Right. So it's, it's not the deprivation, you've deprived yourself of something yes. and then you crave it even more because you, you just crave it even it more. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the next thing about managing diabetes, healthy coping. There's something called diabetes distress because we give all these instructions. Take your medicine or eat this, exercise. Many, many people diagnosed with diabetes express this feeling of being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They have their lives to manage. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have the disease to manage. Mm -hmm. They have the emotional and psychological aspect of the disease to manage. Manage as well. They're like, I not so you much. Know, so what I tell people is do not hold yourself to very high standards. Mm -hmm. It's okay if there is Thanksgiving and you have a piece of cake on that day. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the issue would be if you take a huge piece of that cake as carry out and keep it in your refrigerator. <laughs> and every day, take it and out. Every day. You yes. don't want to do that. But when everybody is having, partying and having fun, you can you have a piece. in the corner over there and, and, and with, with, your, with, your, with your carrots and your soup. Yes. The, yeah, you and then you really do feel miserable. Yes. And there are a lot of different ways you can. There's something called food exchange, meaning... It's my birthday. We're going with friends to what cheesecake factory, and I really want to have the cheesecake. Mm -hmm. So when we get there, everybody's ordering a pasta meal. Guess what? I order a chef salad. Those are leaves. The carbohydrates. It's very small. Right. So maybe my whole plate of salad is only about fifteen grams of carbohydrates. Right. And lots of protein from the chicken or the salmon that they put on the salad. Mm -hmm. Then guess what? My cake comes and I eat half of it and that's about 30 grams of carbs. I'm still within the recommended guidelines. But mm -hmm. guess what? I ate what I wanted to eat. Mm -hmm. So you don't leave that cheesecake factory saying, look, I went there because of this thing. I was not able yes. to eat this at yes. all. You can yes. say you did eat it. You just ate it. Ate yes. It. So Definitely. that is the importance of education when it comes to these diseases. Definitely. People will say, oh, what are they telling me? No, there's a lot to learn about it. Right. It empowers you. You can make those decisions. You can play around with stuff and your blood sugar still stays within reasonable, acceptable range or target range. Perfect. Perfect. So now let, let me go to the next question that mm -hmm. I was going to ask. So what are the myths? Because you said knowledge, you talked about the fact that knowledge is what you need to know, things that you need to know. Mm -hmm. So what are the com what are some common myths that people believe? If you have diabetes, oh, this, this, oh, this, or that, which uh, somebody told you or you saw it online or in a TikTok thing. What are some common myths that people that we need to debunk here? Yeah, interestingly, we have addressed some of them. Yes, <laughs> like yes. Uh, diabetes is reversible. That's a big one because people have written books, do this to reverse your diabetes, take this supplement to reverse your diabetes, and all of that. That's the biggest one. As I said, if the pancreas are affected and some of the cells are destroyed, we cannot mm -hmm. regenerate those cells. So that results in what? Uh, diabetes, uh, insulin insufficiency mm -hmm. and that will cause your blood sugars to be elevated or insulin resistance will cause your sugars to be elevated. Mm -hmm. Then the other one that you hear most of the time is I have diabetes, I cannot eat carbohydrates. That is, and most people who do that, they start getting depressed because of the disease, because it's like I'm not enjoying life. Most, right. If you realize a lot of the food that tastes good are carbs. For it. You can eat diet, you can eat carbohydrates, but you have to eat them in reasonable portions. For it. You have to prioritize complex carbohydrates, which are mostly like starchy vegetables and grains, like over said. simple sugars, the cakes and the pies and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to watch your portions. We just talked about the plate method, or you can do cup counting. For it. Some people would count their carbs and keep their carbs, their carbs. The recommendation is 45 to 60 grams of carbs for each meal. And for each snack, 15 to 30 grams of carbs. So once you have been trained to count carbs, you can control what you eat based on right. carb counting. 
So can we can somebody just go online and find uh, 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 that that information and follow that? Or do there you have are some, yeah, mm -hmm. there, there's some information, but it makes sense if somebody explains it to you. Correct. So I don't do because now we know that everything we we, we we Google things and not everything that you see because you you enter the certain search words there mm -hmm. and it pops up just because it's on the internet sitting there it typed doesn't mean it's the correct thing to do. Yeah, there is information, but it's just better if somebody who knows what they're doing can explain it to you so that you put it together. Correct. So it's like go under the advice of a, of, a, of a, somebody in the medical. Yes, it, a diabetes care and education specialist, um, an endocrinologist, a primary care doctor, a nurse practitioner, somebody who has been trained on diabetes management specifically. So they know that they know what they're telling you. Yes, right. And, and they also speak to you too, you this individual, as opposed to just something sitting out there which may not be tailored to you and your own specifics. Yes. Then uh, sometimes you hear people talk about, I cannot uh, drink alcohol ab at all. I used to drink a little bit of wine, no, now they diagnose me with diabetes and I cannot even put anything in my mouth. And you see them in a party, they are so miserable. They are sitting there, but no, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You can have a drink, but it depends on how much and what you're drinking. Correct. You are really Direct, they were, which has, you said, no, 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 not those. No, you can have a drink. Mm -hmm. As we said before, the first thing is you have to eat something before you drink. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing is you have to know what are the guidelines, what are the recommendations. It's recommended that for males, you have no more than two drinks. Okay. So the question is, what is one drink? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> two drinks, so, a tall glass of beer, a, a, a <laughs> mug of beer, uh, what are, how many shots what? of whiskey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for males, no more than two drinks. For females, no more than one drink in a 24-hour period. So for, 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 female, for males, one drink is like one and a half ounce of hard liquor. That's one drink. Okay. One and a half ounce, 1.5 ounce of the liquor. That's a shot. Okay. Okay. Or 12 ounces of beer. Which that's is a bottle of beer. 12, 12 free bottle. ounces of beer. That's a bottle of beer. Or um, four ounces of wine. That's a glass of wine. Mm -hmm. That's one drink. So if you do those things times two, then you had two drinks. So females can do one. Most females would do, just do wine anyway. Maybe a glass of wine. That's fine. So you don't have to deprive yourself. But okay. you want to stay away from high fructose drinks. And you want to make sure that you've, you've eaten something before you do that. Perfect. The other myth that I hear is, oh, let me just eat whatever I need to eat. After I'll go home and I'll inject insulin. I'm already on insulin. Terrible. Terrible. That that is that that bothers me. That that is scary. It uh, even from 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 a lay point of view, I'm looking at that and like, mm. yes, people do that. I have actually been in a place where somebody said something like that oh just give me the cake let me eat i'll go home and i'm like yeah but again it has to do with the knowledge gap they don't know they don't know any better when yes when we know better we do better yes. so insulin is calculated based on your body weight and also your kidney function mm -hmm. so when you go home and you're doing extra doses of insulin because you want to eat all these extra things or big portions you're not doing your body a service. There's something called insulin stacking, which may occur. We don't know when it can occur. Right. Meaning that the, the, the insulin piles on top of each other as you're taking it. Mm -hmm. When it gets to a point, guess what? You just start having uncontrollable low sugars. Mm. You can even go into seizures. Wow. So that's the danger of dosing yourself, not following the doctor's prescription. Right, right. I, I was going to ask about this because you have about amputations. Complications of diabetes. That is, that's okay. Those are the complications. Can you just talk we about We can talk about that. Please do. Please do. So, so as, as, when, when we started, I mentioned that diabetes affects various organs of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it could affect the eyes. Hmm. 
more than 50% of blindness that we see is related to poorly controlled diabetes. Really? Control, yes, that we see. There's something called diabetes retinopathy. Hmm. It means diabetes has messed up the retina of the eye. Wow. I don't think I quite I quite knew that because I have I, I was asking about amputations, so that's what I've heard. Amputations. The, 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 I'll get to the amputation. But I, have, I didn't know that there was connect. I didn't know. I've heard mm -hmm. of coma and other things that do, I haven't I didn't realize that yeah. it actually affect your eyes and cost you. It does. Get so it is recommended as part of health maintenance, it's recommended that if you're diabetic, you at least go for a comprehensive eye exam at least once a year. To get make sure that your eyes are doing okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, the heart heart disease. Diabetes when blood sugars are very high, it can cause your blood vessels that go to the heart, heart to be hard stenosis, mm. and that can lead to what heart disease and other issues. Correct. It increases the risk of blood clotting. Think about it. If you take water and you add sugar to it and you add fat to it and you add sugar to it and you add, what happens to the consistency? It becomes thick. Thickens, yes. So when you have high viscosity as a result of, on, your lipids are high, meaning cholesterol and all of that, and blood sugar is high, your risk for developing blood clots also increases. If the blood clot travels to your heart, we call it what? Heart attack. Yeah. It travels to your lung, we call it what? Pulmonary emboli. It travels to your brain, what do we call it? Stroke. It's stroke, clinical stroke. That is all related to, to diabetes. Wow. Let's talk about kidney. Kidney disease also has a strong relationship to diabetes. Hmm. When diabetes is uncontrolled, it messes the blood vessels of the kidneys. I'm just keeping it simple. Right. It's also in kidney failure. You would realize that a lot of people who are on dialysis, dialysis, if you ask them, they will tell you they have diabetes. Many people. Wow. Then we're not giving this diabetes the 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 the, the the seriousness that, that it really has, because it actually branches out. We yes. tell about diabetes, layman's thoughts, diabetes is this one thing. It's a terrible it, disease. But the way it spreads out and stretches out yeah. and can affect, it I'm learning from you today that it's it goes everywhere. It, it goes everywhere. So your kidneys could be messed by uncontrolled diabetes. So when, how do we manage that in the hospital? You, we, you can come in, they do what they call blood chemistry and check for your, check your kidneys or sometimes they will take your urine and check for protein in your urine. Mm -hmm. Protein is not supposed to filter through the kidneys and appear in urine. If protein filters, it means that the filtration system of the kidneys has been broken. And guess what breaks, breaks it down? Diabetes, because glucose molecules are big. When they go through the filtration system, they break the filter. Then guess what? Other things that are not supposed to go through it, like protein, starts going Pass through. right through. It's like, a, I'm just, my own analogy is like, just looking at my sieve downstairs. This, 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 this sieve, you're supposed to be sieving things. Through. You know how we used to have those nets like ones back home? Yeah. This, this was a that plastic here that the size of the holes is already measured. But yeah. those ones that we used to have back home, you can, it's like a mosquito net, the threads are moving. Something hard came and forced its way through. It's way down, through. The, gap is, the wall is bigger. Other things that we're not supposed to go now go through. Go through. Wow. It. So now it messes up the kidneys. Mm -hmm. So usually doctors will do some a urine test to check for protein in your urine called urine microalbumin or something. Then uh, nephropathy, uh, kidney disease related to diabetes, nephropathy. Then we have neuropathy, which is your nerves. Mm -hmm. Diabetes can burn your nerves. You know, people with diabetes will tell you, sometimes I feel like needles and, and burning sensation on my feet. My feet get hot and all of that when their sugars are high. Right. 
When that continues over and over again, it messes up the nerves. When the nerves are burned, guess what? They lose sensation. I don't know if you've ever been to the doctor and the doctor tells you to remove your shoes and he takes something like uh, a wire and touches different parts of your below your feet and tell close your eyes and tell me if you feel anything. I haven't had that yet. Yes, they do that, mm -hmm. especially for people with diabetes. They will do that. And if they have lost sensation, then they can send them to specialty care like a podiatrist okay. to design uh, specific kinds of specialized shoes for them and all of that. Mm -hmm. So the risk factor of amputation comes with neuropathy, the loss of nerves. So when you lose your nerve, your, your sensation and the nerves are, are messed up, you can be going around your yard and doing yard work bare feet. That's why we tell them reduce risk by don't by avoid walking around bare, barefooted. So all it takes is for a small piece of wood to pierce through your foot and trouble starts. When your blood sugars are high, the smallest wound becomes a challenge to heal. That's where when I said about gangrene. Yes. They, we have that uh, organism called staph, Staphylococcus aureus. It would just cause the chopped flesh-eating bacteria. Lord have mercy. One thing after another until it, go, it gets to the bone. Oh, Lordy. Then you end up with what? Amputation if they can't do anything. Right. So the thing which, which if you didn't have that condition, we are all are, you, growing up, you have a little cut, have a little this, you treat it and it's good, it's well and good and you're back to go after putting a little bandaid on the thing. For somebody now in this condition, it's a whole different... It's different. We normally tell people with diabetes, we say if you have a wound, something sticks, pierce you. Because you can have a piece of wood can pierce you and you, you look at it and take it out and you feel like, oh, I took everything out. Not knowing that some part of it is in there. And then it results in what? An abscess and other things happen. So it's always good for them to report to the hospital just to make sure and report, go to the emergency department. I have diabetes and I was moving around and something pierced my feet. Please, I just wanted to check and they'll check it. And sometimes if they, there's a need, they might give you a topical antibiotic to put on it or something. But they have to take care of their feet. The other thing is they also have to inspect their feet even if there's no injury. Okay. Because we are in a culture where we are constantly wearing close toe shoes and that traps moisture. Okay. So when moisture is trapped, sometimes below, underneath the toes, especially when we are getting older, you see some people's, their toes are clenched together. Between the toes, underneath the toes, you want to check it. Because if, God forbid, the skin breaks as a result of moisture, Mm -hmm. something could be growing in there if you have lost sensation and you don't know it. I've seen no. it happen. And one day your foot is just swollen and you don't know why it's swollen. You come to the hospital. When the doctor inspects it or the nurse inspects it, they say, oops, you have something here. Did you know you have something here? You and say. the person is saying no. So if the person is a big is big in size and they can't lift their legs to look at below their feet. We say put a mirror on the floor and cover your feet over the mirror right. and look. Interesting. If you have a relative, tell the person at least three times a week, check your feet. Check between your toes. So this is if you're already diabetic. If you have diabetes. If you have diabetes already. But even if you don't have diabetes, it's she just a good pra good practice after a shower or anything to clean between your toes and dry between your toes and all of that. Wow. We were thinking the only thing to worry about, about uh, moisture, water between your toes is water rain. <laughs> then trimming of toenails for diabetics. Right. Remember that they already have issues with their eyes. So if you're having issues with your eyes and you have diabetes, we recommend that do not trim your toenails by yourself. It's better for you to go to the hospital and have a podiatry or somebody put a, a foot technician trim it for you. Okay, what's because all it all it takes is oh, just for you to mistakenly clip a piece of flesh. Right. Oh. And boom, something bad starts happening. Right. So probably you shouldn't. So all these pedicures. Mm -mm. Not a good thing for people who have diabetes, though. 
file the nails or if you have to clip it clip it high not close to your flesh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you file it down so you clip high and file it down that's the way to do it nice. so we've talked about complications of the eyes the heart the kidney and we talked about uh, neuropathy right so i think those are the major complications you mm. know We've learned a lot in the, I, I, I haven't even lost count of, of, of how much time has gone by. I've just been listening there and swallowing the information mm -hmm. and going, hmm, this is the kind of show that I myself will sit and listen to and mm -hmm. say, take note of everything that you've heard there and just plan accordingly. So then, would you be willing, because this is, this is, um, you talked about it, knowledge is power. Knowledge can help to prevent, when you know better, you do better and we can prevent some of these things. We've talked about diabetes today. Um, even on this same subject, would you be willing to just come and like have a webinar kind of a thing these days? Not everybody has to travel to somebody's cabinet, their the doctor's office, and sit there. Would you be willing to do it like a Zoom thing, webinar thing? People sign up for it if they're interested, if they have questions based on what we have just been talking about here. Because I know my, my cell phone is going to go off when this thing is. Um, ask her this, ask her that, but you cannot do that now because we already had the show and sat down here and did this. So would that is that something that you would consider doing? Yeah, we, we can do that if your audience uh want to learn more or if they have questions, we can do that. Uh I know the other questions I've had is about diabetes medications. Sometimes I've had uh patients who say, Oh, but my sister is diabetes, has diabetes, and they are just on one medicine. Why did the doctor put me on three medicines? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. And they're upset that it's a something, some kind of uh, 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 agreement between the between the medical practitioners and pharmaceutical industry to give mm -hmm. them a lot of medication. You will hear stuff like that, right? But that is not true. The disease progression is different for person to people. Person. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when people are diagnosed initially, the doctor might start them with one medicine, and all these medicines have different targets and different mode of actions. Mm -hmm. So they might start them with something like metformin. Okay. Metformin, what does it do? Metformin would control the release of glucose from the liver to the bloodstream. That's how it lowers your sugar. Right. It's also called glucophage. Then if that didn't work, the doctor might say, oh, let me add a second one. They might add something like glipizide. Or that's the sulfonylurea that would right. stimulate the pancreas now to give you insulin. So you see, he is attacking that disease from different directions. Right. It's not a matter and that of didn't work and say, more than the other person. It's a matter of yes. which person's needs. Yes. But the other person achieved their target glucose with just one medication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that a lot of times on the patient's side is frustrating. They don't understand it and, you know. And so, I would say sometimes back home too, people tend not to ask any questions. The, the even here, say, even here, the white coat syndrome. A lot of times, if you don't really have a relationship, a good relationship with your doctor, it could be intimidating going to the hospital. So you go there and he has done the last and he said, this is this, 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 I'll start you on this, yes, doctor. And you walk away. Uh -huh. And by the time <laughs> the nurse walks in and you have a list of questions and the nurse is looking like, I thought you just saw the doctor. doctor. Yeah. yeah, but it can be very intimidating. So the other thing that I teach is to prepare for your medical appointments. How do you prepare for your 15 minutes medical appointment? Write uh -huh. down those questions. I, I, I do it all the time. By the time I go to my doctor's office, I have written down stuff. If I have family members so, who are sick, they say, any questions for me, it's not then that you're like, mm, okay, what about this? You have already thought some of the things out, out, and have them ready to ask, and then you're only asking maybe questions that that result from what they have just said to you that you had not, uh, you're not aware of. Yes, good idea. And that is that is your right as a patient. You have to ask those questions. It's a service, and your people. doctor is as good as the information that you provide. Correct. And how do you provide that information to be knowledgeable about what is going on with you? Mm -hmm. 
explain to them when, when they do so because they'll ask you other things you volunteer yeah and, and be, be accurate as accurate about the things as possible i cannot yeah. like i used to, to to make this joke about people who you have gone and lied on your age about how old you are on your birth certificate and you have the nerve now to go to the doctor's office and mm -hmm. still say the wrong age there the wrong age yeah but you've already said here that what a 40 year old gets is different from what a 30 year old gets and that kind of a thing like i'm like are you you have to be kidding me how that's the one place where you cannot afford to lie or telling lies about alcohol alcohol consumption mm -hmm. and the doctor is looking at your your diagnostic test and you have else. fatty liver yeah and he's like there's really? something wrong here you don't drink alcohol <laughs> you know <laughs> or you do, i don't smoke and when you when you do that's mm -hmm. when it's time to go and be the, the, like I, guess, I said there's two places the priest or the pastor and the doctor please just go tell your truth there <laughs> the two things the two even whatever else that you think that you should go and lie not to those two specifically and the doctor, because they can only, like you just said, whatever they're giving you there is based on what you have said. Yes. When they say, how many times did you go to a stool today? They're not follow, they were not in the bathroom with you to see exactly. if you really did poop or whatever it is. Exactly. If you say one time, or oh, I've not gone at all, then they know, you say, take this milk of magnesia mm -hmm. or do this, or you know, it's wow. This has this has been very, very enlightening. Mm -hmm. Learned a lot. And I really, really, really would 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 follow up on the um depending on how the audience relax re, 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 responds to this, figure out whether we can do this things is something that you are going to consider doing, and of course going to all the um conditions. Of to course, yes, there are many yes. other conditions that um, we can talk about. Because even if we're talking about this one, if we're talking about this one, you've talked about the other things, dialysis. So that has to be kidney disease, disease. Mm -hmm. heart disease. Uh, high blood pressure, and I'm not be surprised that if you say when you're talking about high blood pressure, these are the ones to what we're talking about today comes in. Yeah, they are all interrelated. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. we need to thank you so 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 much. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Is there anything last thing that I may not have thought of asking that has that comes to mind? I think for we, the we, most part we address most of the th we touched most of the things and. Uh, if your audience, again, if your audience wants to learn more, we can always have a Zoom and a conversation about it. Right. Or uh, well, the next oh, time you come, um, when whatever questions that we that they bring up now, we can start there by saying, okay, you know, remember this time we talked about uh, diabetes? Somebody asked me this question and we can address the matters arising okay. <laughs> from this one and then start over there. I am really... That's a great idea. <laughs> I'm grateful so so grateful because there's nothing like useless information it's not no if, it's, if somebody already knew it then it's a good reminder and if you did not know now you have learned yeah so i want to really thank you dr malingui i'm a little sister but you've earned that that doctorate in every fair and square sense of the word thank, thank you for knowledge that you're willing to share thank you the betterment of our community thank you so much thank you sister Etonde. thank you for having me you're very <laughs> welcome <laughs>